Good afternoon. Thank you. I'll try again. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Well, welcome to Converging on Wicked Systems Problems. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here today taking time to engage in this critical conversation about the future of science on food, agriculture, and natural resources challenges. As I was thinking about this session today over the weekend, uh, it reminded me of a quote from Ursula Le Guin, who said, I never knew anybody who found life simple. I think a life or a time looks simple when you leave out the details. And so today, we're going to focus a little bit on the details. So what in the world is a wicked problem? Well, wicked problems are complex, they're contradictory, the solution often reveals or creates more problems. They have so many interacting parts that it can be really hard to grasp what exactly the problem is or how to tackle it. Food security, climate change, increasing antibiotic resistance, water quality, these all would fall into a category of wicked problems. They're problems that are time consuming, they're non-sequential, with no clear beginning, middle, or end. They are systems problems, often engaging not just one large system, but multiple ones. And they are human problems, involving people with different opinions, values, interests, and conceptions of how the problem should be defined and solved. There are no obvious or easy solutions, and technical solutions alone are hardly sufficient. As a land-grant institution, converging on wicked problems is kind of what we do. As we celebrate the sesquicentennial of Ohio State, we're commemorating 150 years of engaging with the public to ensure a better future. The impact of our land-grant universities over the past 150 years has been profound. Successfully addressing the challenges of our young nation in feeding itself and then growing into a wide spectrum of worldwide impact and technological advancements. Many of those changes began within agriculture, but led a revolution in our nation's technology transfer and our economic and scientific successes. The College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences, or as we think of it, the Cornerstone College at OSU, is focused on four grand challenges, all of which are wicked problems. Of particular relevance for today's conversation is the challenge of sustainability, simultaneously ensuring viable agriculture production, food security and safety, and environmental and ecosystem sustainability. We address this challenge by translating our basic research into applications that can be tested and applied leading to meaningful outcomes and solutions by producers, entrepreneurs, and decision makers. For example, our researchers are deeply involved in the scientific study of the harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie and in developing effective management practices and technological solutions to address the problems. To do this, we work in interdisciplinary teams with colleagues and partners, centers and institutes from across the college and university, including the OSU Sustainability Institute, which is our co-host for today's event. And we are actively engaged with many partners from business and industry, NGOs, communities, other universities, and elected officials. Today, we're honored to host this event, which is part of a series of symposia marking the 75th anniversary of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources. 
Since its founding in 1863, the National Academies have been the nation's premier scientific organization designed to provide nonpartisan, objective guidance for decision makers on pressing issues. The National Academy's study process involves convening committees of top scientists to survey the landscape of relevant research, hold public meetings to gather information, and deliberate to reach consensus, which results in a shared understanding of what the evidence reveals and the best paths forward, all strategies recommended for tackling wicked problems. The work of the National Academies is guided by several boards that oversee topic areas. Formed in 1944, the Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources, or Banner for short, has focused on critical food, agricultural, and natural resources issues. Recent Banner studies have addressed issues surrounding genetically engineered crops, biotechnology and forest health, and a sweeping study of scientific breakthroughs expected to revolutionize food and agricultural research by 2030. Committee reports issued by Banner are frequently used to guide policymakers and engage the public. Now is the critical time for advancing our understanding and our ability to address the wicked problems of sustainability, especially those of our agricultural and natural resource systems. We're excited to partner today with the National Academies to host this event. Thank you again for attending, and I encourage you to be an active participant, not only listening, but joining the discussion, reflecting on the tangible ways you and others are helping build the research, education, and partnerships needed to address these wicked problems. I'd now like to turn the discussion over to our faculty co-hosts, both from our college. Dr. Douglas Jackson Smith is a rural sociologist within the School of Environment and Natural Resources. He currently serves as an appointed member of Banner. And Dr. Alina Irwin, environmental economist in the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Development Economics, who also serves as faculty director of the Sustainability Institute at Ohio State. Please join me in welcoming them to the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Kress. Thank you personally for your vision, for your encouragement, for your support. We are here today because of your leadership, and I wanted to sincerely thank you for that. And thank you all for being here, for taking time out of the busy work schedule uh, to spend some time with us talking about an important issue, really important issues uh, that we don't always take the time to, to reflect on and to think about. And thank you to our panelists for traveling uh, from near and far uh, to join us. We're going to be hearing from them in just a little bit. Um, before we do, I just wanted to share a few more thoughts with you on uh, what it is we're talking about today. Dean Kress shared a bit about wicked problems and what is meant by this phrase. Uh, the term has its roots in planning and policy sciences and was proposed originally by two design theorists, Horst Riddle and Melvin Weber to draw attention to the complexities and challenges of addressing social policy problems. Unlike tame problems, and they were thinking of problems like in mathematics or chess, wicked problems are those that lack clarity, both in terms of their aims and their solutions. And this is true for many reasons, because of the systems kind of problems that they are that Dean Kress talked about. And they're problems that involve people. People are never simple. <laughs> People are hugely complex, and wicked problems have all kinds of interactions of individuals, of communities, of organizations, all interacting in many different ways, each with each other, but then also with the environment, with other systems, natural and built systems. And so this is really a systems of systems kind of problem. And as a result of those interdependencies, there are no clearly defined boundaries. These problems bleed into each other. It's like what John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, 
we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Because wicked problems are system problems and they're human problems, it's not like we can really study them in a lab setting. Right? We can't set up the experiment, run the experiment, and figure out the solution. There's really no trial and error in the same way that we might run an experiment like that. We might be able to do some things on small scale or in a virtual lab, but when we are implementing the solution at scale, it is never risk-free. It's as Ritter and Weber put it, every trial counts. Technology is critical, but technology alone can't solve the problem. History is littered with examples of technological innovations that once developed don't really make it past the prototype stage or they get implemented and scaled and never used because they weren't really solving the problem. The reality is we may not actually be able to solve wicked problems. The best that we might be able to do is to improve the situation, perhaps tame the problem or avoid the greatest pitfalls. And whether we're solving or taming the problem really depends on where you stand and how you view the world, what your values are. By definition, wicked problems require trade-offs across fundamentally different goals. And once we fix one aspect of the problem, we may inadvertently aggravate another part of the problem. That's kind of hard for us scientists and educators who see ourselves as problem solvers to accept. And so where does that leave us and where does that leave the university. That is really the key question that we want to try to consider here today, which is what is the university's role in helping us to tackle these wicked problems? What are some examples of our successes and where have we failed? And what are the barriers to doing more? The dean has given us a vision that is so critical in terms of moving us forward in the right direction, doing more with translational science, working more closely with our partners, and we're doing a lot of that already here at Ohio State in the college as well as in other colleges to foster more team science and community engaged research. One example of many is the Food Energy and Water Systems Integrated Modeling Project that Doug and I are engaged with, with some of our colleagues, uh, and I saw some of them here in the room, someplace, there they are. <laughs> um, here from the college as well as from other colleges like engineering and the Glenn College of Public Affairs. Um, and we're also working with external partners, including one who you'll be hearing from momentarily, uh, one of our panelists. Our goal with this project is to project how various globalizing and deglobalizing forces, trade wars, environmental regulations, other national and global uh, conditions, will impact agriculture and energy systems and water quality outcomes in the Great Lakes region. It's an ambitious research project and it's really only possible because of the willingness of our faculty team to engage in really hard interdisciplinary research that is very time consuming and frankly the payoff will be in the years to come. There are other such efforts that are going on here with amazing faculty who are at the leading edge of doing this kind of work with centers and institutes like the Sustainability Institute that provide a critical platform for bringing people together to do this work. Unfortunately, I don't have time to highlight all of them. But the point I'd like to make is this. We are succeeding at doing some of these things. But there's still substantial barriers at universities that ultimately limit the amount of time and effort that faculty are able to invest in this kind of work. And in the spirit of challenging us today, I would like to highlight what some of those barriers are. I'm then going to turn it over to our panelists, and they're going to challenge us even more. So hold on to your seats. The first is the traditional incentives for research at universities frankly create a huge barrier. Promotion and tenure, recognitions and rewards, opportunities for advancement, these come with establishing oneself as an expert in one's discipline, which most often means a focus on disciplinary research, and in some cases a focus on more basic or fundamental research that is not clearly linked to real world problems. Even for disciplines and departments in which applied research is the norm, what matters is published scholarly articles. Communicating the results to broader audiences, engaging with stakeholders, that's mostly left to others so that we faculty don't have to spend time doing things that detract from our teaching and research duties. Now don't get me wrong, lots of faculty do these broader things and some really want the opportunity to do more. My point is really about the rewards and the incentives structures. We don't get the same reward or recognition for doing these things, and there are only so many hours in the day, and everyone has to face trade-offs. 
Faculty, especially junior professors, often have no choice but to pour all their non-teaching time into getting the next scholarly paper out the door. All those other activities, which are so critical for informing and improving the impact of our research, are by and large viewed as being separate from research. As long as engaging and communicating with stakeholders is treated as a separate from doing research, we will fall short of doing our best to address these wicked problems. Another barrier is the dominant culture of academia. The culture in which many disciplines and departments live is one in which disciplinary work is often viewed as higher quality and more rigorous than interdisciplinary work. Metrics of individual research productivity are valued over other kinds of productivity. The more prestigious the journal we publish in, the more citations of our own individual work, the higher our H index, the more external funding we have as a PI, the better we're viewed as doing our job. Universities compare themselves on metrics, such as total research expenditures, total number of elected members to the national academies, and placement of PhD graduates at other prestigious academic institutions. Imagine if we had broader impact measures that we also tracked, like the number of faculty stakeholder research collaborations and the impact that our graduates are having in terms of generating economic value in their jobs and doing good in their communities. Measures of research productivity are absolutely essential for advancing our academic enterprise, but as long as these remain the only way in which R1 institutions assess their research excellence, we will fall short of addressing wicked problems. Like many other universities, Ohio State has invested resources to overcome some of these barriers. And because we're a big place, we've done it in big ways. Most recently through the Discovery Themes program that has resulted in a total of 174 faculty to date, all of whom are supported to do interdisciplinary work. This commitment to interdisciplinary research and faculty has been tremendous. And it's really unprecedented among public universities. It's a huge success story in terms of the willingness of a university to commit itself to supporting interdisciplinary faculty and research over the long run. And while investing these kinds of resources is essential, it isn't enough. Without changing the structures, aligning the, the rewards, and evolving the culture, we risk dissipating the resources that we've invested. The structures that prioritize disciplinary work and individual achievement are simply too strong and too entrenched. So today is a great opportunity for us to wrestle with these and other challenges that we face inside and outside the university as we seek to converge on wicked problems. And to help us with that converging, we've invited three dynamic speakers to share their thoughts with us. We've purposely chosen them on the basis of not only their deep knowledge and their experience of working at various kinds of wicked problems, but also because they represent key sectors that have come together to solve these problems and that must come together in the future if we're going to succeed. The public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector. So we've, each, we've asked each of our panelists to speak for about 15 minutes. Um, and as they are giving their talks, I ask that you listen, think actively about the kinds of questions that you might like to pose, write down and hold those questions in your head, and then we'll take questions at the end. We'll have about 40 minutes or so for panel discussion. Uh, and members of the audience here in the room will be able to ask their questions just by raising your hand. But make sure you're talking into a mic because we also have remote participants joining us through Facebook Live. And we want to make sure that they can hear your questions as well. For those of you who are joining remotely, you'll be able to also ask questions via the chat box. At the, at the end of the panel discussion, um, I'll then turn it over to Doug Jackson-Smith, and he will share his reflections on our conversation and send us off with some final thoughts. So now I'm going to introduce each of our panelists in turn, and, uh, the, and we will start with Dr. Lois Wright-Morton, who is a professor emeritus of sociology in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Iowa State University. Dr. Morton directed from 2011 to 2017 the USDA NIFA Climate and Corn-Based Cropping System Coordinated Agricultural Project, or CAP, a tra transdisciplinary partnership among 11 institutions across the upper Midwest. She's co-authored the primer, Leading Large Transdisciplinary Projects Addressing Social Ecological Systems, and she'll be sharing much more of that work with us today. 
One other thing that I thought you'd appreciate knowing about Lois is that she currently farms in Northeast Ohio, growing blueberries, raspberries, and asparagus for sale at local markets, while she also continues to do research. After we hear from Lois, we'll hear from Ralph Nordstrom, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Great Plains Institute. He has more than 30 years of experience in energy and sustainable development policy and practice, both in governmental and nonprofit settings. He's written or has helped craft new laws on high performance buildings, hydrogen and fuel cell technologies, resource efficient land use, and sustainable development. He was a contributing author to the third National Climate Assessment, a comprehensive report required by con Congress on climate change impacts in the US. He's also held positions with the US Congress, World Wildlife, World Wildlife Fund International, National Wildlife Federation, and Global Environment Program at New York's University Stern School of Business. And last but certainly not least, we will be hearing from Greg Sondland, who is President and CEO of Superior Dairy LEL Logistics and Superior Edge right here in Ohio. Superior Darrier is a manufacturer of fluid milk products with an interest in innovative R&D efforts that create win-win solutions for production efficiency and environmental sustainability. Greg is fascinated with shortening time from lab to implementation and combining science and industry rather than having a linear relationship. Please join me in welcoming Lois Wright Morton to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about uh, my experience and um, uh, some of the team experiences that I've had with uh, convergent science and transdisciplinary. Um, today we're here um, to ask what is the future of agriculture, food, soil, water, and our natural resources, and more importantly, what's the science that we need to produce? What's the science that we need to engage in in order to address, and I'm going to use the word address because solving is just way too big. I, how do we address these wicked problems and what is the science that we need to be able to do that? Um, Dean Kress and Dr. Irwin have talked about what are some of the wicked problems facing society here in Ohio. We have plenty of big wicked problems in Ohio. And the, many of the issues that we have here in Ohio are shared across the nation and globally. Water is a really big issue. And so the extent that we can begin to address and, and find um, solutions to our water issues, um, there's things to be learned from that. So um, uh, we have our own little laboratory here in the state of Ohio. The full economic, social, and environmental costs and loss and degradation of fresh water, of our soil resources, of our um, grasslands, our atmosphere, our forests are not well known. But what we do know is that they're increasing in this degradation. And one of the reasons has to do with uh, um, something that Elena talked about, and that is the trade-offs that we make. In order to solve problems that relate to our food and our water supply and our energy supply, many of our other ecosystem services, which are the foundation of those, are, are also at risk. There are no simple fixes to human natural system problems. I think there's three of us now that have said that, right? <laughs> um, there are no simple system solutions. They're tangled messes. They're complex. And our challenge today is how do we create convergence around these huge daunting problems in order to find solutions? Where do we even begin? And by convergence, I mean, how do we deeply integrate our sciences, our human experiences, our knowledge, and our values to address what is important? The science is necessary, but it's not sufficient. These are tough problems that involve diverse human values, cultural and personal perspectives, and actions. And I think the question that I want to talk about today is, where will the good ideas and solutions come from 
when we begin to solve these problems. How do we co-produce the kind of science, knowledge, practical experiences, and strategies? How do we produce the technologies and the tools that we'll need to solve these wicked problems in agriculture and natural resources? The approach by Stephen Johnson in his book, Where Do Good Ideas Come From? The Natural History of Innovation was a game changer for me when I read it in the fall of 2010. Shortly after I was asked to direct the USDA NIFA climate and corn-based cropping systems, $20 million coordinated agricultural project. It changed how I think about science, who does it, how it's done, and what it can accomplish. Johnson writes, some environments squelch new ideas. Some environments seem to breed them effortlessly. As a sociologist and director of this large transdisciplinary project, 140 scientists, 11 scientific institutions, more than 200 corn soybean farmers from the Midwest, I wanted to create the kind of environment that encouraged generating new ideas and testing them to find the good ones. This meant continually monitoring team social and physical environment to assess what was encouraging new creation, diffusion, and transformation of the good ideas of the team into new scientific questions and approaches. Using the metaphor of the fractal, we see reoccurring patterns in different scales and under different conditions throughout the natural world and the social world. These patterns represent a flow of ideas that are continually connecting, fusing, recombining, to reinvent and transform them into something new and different. Um, Johnson names two uh, strategies that I want to talk about today. One of them is the adjacent possible, and the other is the construction of liquid networks. And he talks about the adjacent possible is that of knowing your inventory of spare parts. And in the sustainable ag program, we, or excuse me, the sustainable corn project, um, this meant knowing as much as possible about our teammates, the science, the practice skills that they brought, the experiences that they brought to the project, and then developing a structure that would allow us to reassemble what we knew in new ways that addressed the problem. In science, we spend a lot of time talking about building on the shoulders of past science. Past science is what is known, what is not known. Um, it's the inventory of spare parts that Johnson's talking about. Some of these parts are conceptual ways of solving problems or new definitions of what constitutes the problem in the first place. Some of them are literally mechanical parts, scientific findings, established knowledge. The land-grant university and their experiment stations have an amazing network of multi-state regional research education and extension projects. These work groups are essential in fostering deep disciplinary and multidisciplinary science around specific research questions. These multidisciplinary projects seek to knit together existing parts, ideas past knowledge, and experiences from several disciplines. And I know most of you out in this room are probably part of a multidisciplinary regional project. But I don't know if you ever thought of yourselves as actually creating the spare parts that would allow us to put them together in some kind of a way to actually address some of these problems. Let's look for just a moment at the structure of how we do science in the academy. And if you look at the illustration here, I know there's a lot happening in this slide. Um, but this is actually the different kinds of structures that we do in the academy when we try to use science um, in order to um, address certain research questions or problems that we have. Disciplinary and multidisciplinary science are necessary building blocks for creating integrated science. Participatory is the knowledge exchange among academic and non-academic participants. We do these two fairly frequently. However, convergence is more than knowledge exchange, and this is the really important part. It means that we actually begin to integrate the many types of knowledge that we have um, available in the people that are 
come together in order to solve a particular problem. Interdisciplinary entails the crossing of disciplinary boundaries. Transdisciplinary is the integration of disciplinary and sectorial boundaries to develop integrated knowledge for science and society. So what does integrated science look like, and how is that different from just simple knowledge exchange? I want to give you three examples from my own work to illustrate the integration of deep disciplinary scientific and non-academic knowledge to address a particular problem. The thing to remember when you think about integrating science is that it requires participants to learn the language of another discipline, to learn their methodologies, their approaches, and to see the phenomena from another perspective. The first project that I want to share with you um, is the Olson and Morton research, which is an example of interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary work. Ken Olson, my co-author at University of Illinois, is a soil scientist with deep knowledge of geological processes, soil properties, excuse me, soil carbon, I organic uh, retention and sequestration, particularly applied to agricultural landscapes, sedimentation, soil conservation management, and land use. Those of you that are soil scientists out there, you know that, right? That, that's what a soil scientist does. My research as a sociologist focused on civic structure, human relationships with water, soil, agriculture, and natural resources, and how values, cultures, and experiences shape the multidisciplinary impacts on individuals and larger society. I'm a rural sociologist like Doug Jackson Smith, and that's the kind of sociology that he does. Um, in the past 10 years, we've learned quite a bit about each other's science, the language of those sciences, and we've published almost 35 papers that integrate our sciences to address practical management of river landscapes. In 2016, we published the book Managing Mississippi and Ohio River Landscapes with the Soil and Water Conservation Society, which examines many of the human natural systems of river landscapes. The Grand River Grasslands Project a transdisciplinary project involves more scientists and landowners. It started with a group of three or four biophysical scientists with deep knowledge about tall grass prairies, cattle grazing, fire management, and species of concern, birds and butterflies, and an invitation to me as a rural sociologist to work with them. One of the results of our effort is, was to integrate our sciences with landowner knowledge and experiences in this reserves as catalyst model that involved landowners in learning with us key processes that were driving ecosystem change and land use practices. And then landowners becoming champions of conservation practices that transferred prescribed burn and other conservation practices. The third project is the Sustainable Corn Cap Project, an example of big transdisciplinarity. And the reason I showed you those, I hope you see that you've got some integrated science building blocks that everybody doesn't have to jump in and work with 140 scientists. <laughs> um, I could never have done it without this, this experience of, of taking another discipline and learning it learning it deeply, and then beginning to work with three or four more scientists and learning their, their ways uh, deeply also. Having assembled a lot of spare parts, Johnson says you need to ensure that you're not just recycling the same old ingredients. The trick to having good ideas is not to sit around in glorious isolation and think big thoughts. The trick is to get more parts on the table. Um, and I have to say, sometimes I'm guilty of that. We sit and, ah, oh, you know, you, it's easy to spin out the, the, uh, uh, the big theory. Um, but then, how do, we, how do we begin to make that happen and realize it? This very large and difficult human natural system problem that the sustainable corn cap focused on was crop resilience under increasingly variable and extreme weather, climate instability, with special attention to carbon, nitrogen, and water cycles. And I think you heard Elena say that we, that we were first funded in 2011. 
and we're 2019, I have people that come up to me and said, well, all right, we gave you 20 million, so have you solved the problem, right? Are you there? <laughs> um, and, and that is the nature of a very large and complex problem. That, no, we've not, we're, we, in fact, some of you probably in the room are still looking at carbon, nitrogen, water. Ohio State was a big partner in this sustainable um, corn project. So here's the really big question. How do we get more spare parts on the table? You create a denser liquid network of people with different perspectives, different experiences, different sciences, different knowledge that will bring more parts to the table and importantly, new configurations as to how to assemble them. A new idea is like a network of cells exploring the adjacent possible of connections that they could make in your mind a constellation of thousands of neurons that are firing in sync with each other for the first time in your brain, and then an idea pops into your consciousness. Johnson dryly observes, you can't have an epiphany with only three neurons firing. The network needs to be densely populated and has to be plastic. It has to be capable of adopting new configurations and making new connections. Thus, it's not the number of neurons but the many connections that have formed between them, that's the source of new ideas and ways of thinking. Here's a schematic of the organizational architecture of the Sustainable Corn Project um, as we submitted it in 2011 or to the USDA when we first began. And then if you look over to your right in 2014, you can see as we developed an environment that was task and team oriented, that that structure began to change and develop. And, it, um, and if, you look at, if, if you think about the disciplinary, the interdisciplinary, the multidisciplinary, the cross-disciplinary, all, all the things that were in that previous slide, you'll see that they're all lumped in there because there was a place for all of, all of those types of ways that we structure our science. Johnson cautions the formation of a liquid network is not the creation of a global brain or a herd mentality. It is not the wisdom of the crowd, but the wisdom of someone in the crowd that sparks new ideas and others in the network to build out. It's not that the network itself is smart. Just because all of us in this room are smart doesn't mean we're going to have um, a spark that's going to revolutionize everything unless we go about creating a structure that allows our ideas and our thoughts to collide and to begin to um, interact. And he says, it's not the network itself that's smart. It's the individuals get smarter because they're connected to the network. So can transdisciplinary strategies really be able to produce the innovations and breakthroughs needed in the next 10 years? We have a problem in, in the academy that once we la launch on to a good term, we keep using it, transdisciplinary, convergence, and all of a sudden it loses its meaning and its power. Um, and so it's really easy for us to become really um, jaded about, okay, so we've talked about that. Sustainability is probably the big one that we're, we all say, you know, we've been talking about sustainability for, for lots and lots of years. Um, but th at some point you have to get serious about doing it and figuring out how to really make it happen. Um, we often name and reward one individual for the brilliant innovations that have changed human society. I mean, I could name them Einstein, you know, Madame Curie. I mean, we, we all have these names that we learned in history about who were the inventors and who were the really big people that changed society. But Johnson, as a historian, challenges the idea that one individual or market competition are the most productive sources of innovation. He quantifies new ideas and inventions that have occurred in the history of humans. And in this illustration that you're looking at on the screen, he divides them into four quadrants. And each one of these quadrants, he's listed the innovations that happened in the period from the 1800s to present. And he's, he's identified whether they were non-market individuals, whether they were non-market networked, um, whether they were market networked, and whether they were market competition individual uh, innovations. 
The term non-market represents primarily the universities, the academy, and other non-market NGOs um, that are doing um, scientific uh, and doing um, um, inventive work. You can see from this illustration that the Academy has been a really important science and a source of innovation and technologies, particularly as a networked non-market environment. And that brings us back to Johnson's claim that some environments squelch new ideas and some environments seem to breed them effortlessly. So we've done a good job in the past, so do we say, okay, I feel pretty good about this, you know, um, or, or do we begin to think, okay, so what's the next challenge that we have? The 21st century science will be marked by synthesis. The challenge is to scale up and integrate from cells to organisms to larger ecosystems, incorporating human institutions and the changes across time. Adaptations in human institutions are a key factor in better understanding complex interactions among climatic conditions, vegetation, soil, water, livestock, food systems, humans, this, these interacting um, systems that all of us work with. Scientific uh, innovation to be successful will require institutional change in how we think about science and how we do science, and then improved organizational structures that will strengthen our capacity to better connect theory, and I want to actually say not theory of a single discipline, but connect the theory of many of our disciplines and begin to see how those theories converge in some way um, to inform um, how we might move forward. Um, and so that means how we connect our theories, our data, and the reality as we strive to solve important society problems. So we can't afford to rest on our past successes. We must change ourselves and our institutions to think differently about how we organize our resources and approaches, paying attention to the non-academic values and experiences and knowledge, and create new spaces and institutional environments where knowledge, values, perspectives are shared, where ideas can collide. Collide means that I don't always agree, right? <laughs> this is, we're not just holding hands and saying kumbaya, right? Um, we're, we're, our, our ideas need to play off of each other in a very respectful way so that we can come to new hunches and we can refine some of the ways that we're thinking about as we're exposed to new networks. For us in the scientific community, this means taking the new ideas and solutions and testing them using our scientific approach, our scientific evidence, and our practical experience. So convergence and transdisciplinariness does not say that we throw out the practice and approaches and the methods that we've used that have brought us to where we are. It's how can we begin to integrate those approaches and take us to the next level to deal with this kind of complexity. Johnson's insight is that ground zero of past innovation was not the microscope, but rather the conference table. And for us here in agriculture, I would add the field. Um, the things that I've learned out in the field, um, I might never have learned in the, conference, in, in the conference room, but when you have scientists and farmers and those that are working the land around you, the way that ideas can um, be shared is powerful. For transdisciplinary teams, it's the face-to-face -face and virtual meetings where researchers, practitioners, farmers, and industry gather formally and informally to present and discuss their latest work. Collisions of information and ideas happen when different fields of expertise converge in the same physical and intellectual space. The group environment helps to recontextualize the problems. When a team questions force researchers to rethink their experiments at a different scale or a different level and force farmers and industry to rethink their practices. These group interactions among different disciplines and non-academic members um, can provide the space to challenge assumptions about surprising findings and will make it less likely that the next breakthrough in science is not thrown away because it's experimental error. The most productive tool for generating good ideas is a circle of humans. 
in the lab, um, during field days, in symposiums like the one today, create an environment where new combinations can occur, where information can spill over from one project to another. When you work alone, peering into your microscope, your ideas can get trapped in place. And I say microscope, when I, when I get alone with my own theories and my own disciplines, um, I can get trapped in the history of my disciplinary theories. Um, and you get stuck in your own initial biases. The social flow of the group conversation turns that private solid state into a liquid network. The key is to construct spaces so information spillover is a feature, not a flaw, designed to leak. Is it easy to create these kinds of environments? What are the barriers to collaborative models of problem solving? There are many. First, I want to say innovation and transdisciplinary science need courageous leadership and vision for what is possible. The comfort and ease of status quo is powerful, and change at many levels is very difficult. This is my list. I suspect you have your own list, so I'm not even going to spend time talking about it. They haven't given me two hours, right? <laughs> um, there is a paralyzing effect of uncertainty on decision making in the farm community around climate change. To be uncertain means to be unsure or have doubt. And in a random sample survey of Midwestern farmers, we found that over 90% perceived there was too much uncertainty about the impacts of climate to, change, to justify changing their agricultural practices and strategies despite scientific evidence regarding the causes and potential consequences of climate change. And you're saying, well, why did she just jump to that? That seems like a little out of context. Our findings suggest that a combination of insufficient information and normative influences on climate beliefs are influencing farmer uncertainty. More information may be insufficient to address claims of uncertainty when differing political, cultural norms contest the parameters of climate change or fill in the blank any other wicked big problem. So here's my takeaway. Scientific knowledge must be linked to social values and beliefs and trusted networks for widespread change to occur. Let me conclude with this comment. My experience with the sustainable corn cap is that the next generation of scientists are ready and willing to embrace convergent science and transdisciplinary projects. For me, that's really exciting. Thank you, Lois. So our next speaker is Ralph Nordstrom, a, a man I was uh, lucky enough to get introduced to through our collaborative transdisciplinary project that Alina talked about. And I do think the perspective of academics is something that's well represented in the room and I could talk about and all of us could talk about at great length. But what Rolf brings is a sort of a fresh perspective in the speaker after um, of what the world looks like when you're not locked within the ivory towers. Doug, thank you. How are y'all? You doing all right? You hanging in there? Your brains are not full yet? Got that post-lunch kind of sleepy. Okay, this will be good. I bring you greetings from the bold north. If that turn of phrase is not familiar, that is Minnesota's rebrand, <laughs> right? We are not a cold northern state anymore. We are the bold north. So come, come visit us. Be kind. So I'm, I'm really honored and pleased to be a part of this lecture series and part of the panel. I want to thank my Ohio State uh, hosts and colleagues for inviting me. Really, really pleased to be here. So this is a lot to ask uh, for the next 15 minutes, but uh, as my title slide suggests, I want to propose to you, I think it's a, sort of an audacious proposal, but I want to suggest to you that we have a system design problem and that the concept of a circular economy is required both to do convergent science well, but also I think a circular economy is going to be needed simply as the mental model and the paradigm for how we use and move resources uh, around the globe in the future, and I mean all resources, energy, water, materials. I shall explain. Uh, 
Before I do explain, though, just briefly so you know who is standing in front of you, um, as alluded to, my day job is as CEO of the Great Plains Institute. Uh, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, energy policy and technology institute. We're based in Minneapolis, but we work lo locally and regionally and nationally on this humble little mission here to transform the energy system. That's it, that's all we're trying to do. Transform the energy system for both economic and environmental benefit. And in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over these four big, what I consider to be our mid-century goals. You can read them faster than I could read them to you anyway, but just know that those four goals taken together characterize what we think it means to transform the energy system. So, um, so to start with, I, I wanna start with, I guess what you would call a truism, which is that the design of human systems dictate what those systems can produce. That is, whatever the system design, you couldn't expect that system to produce anything other than what it's producing by virtue of the way it's designed. Hope I've said that clearly. And whether it's intentional or not, I would put to you that the, our global system today of production and consumption is more or less a straight line. That oversimplifies matters a little, but not all that much, right? We, as a human species, we take things out of the ground or off the land, we make things, and then we throw them away. True, we do recycle some things. There are some uh, parts of our economy that get recycled, but for all intents and purposes, it's quite a linear system. And I don't think you need to be uh, a biologist to know that linear systems eventually exhaust themselves uh, over some time frame. We don't know if that's 50 years or 5,000 years, but a linear system is not really a sustainable model almost by definition. Uh, and in fact, I guess I'd like to suggest that many of the problems we face in all of these big systems, energy, water, food, other systems, are actually symptoms of that linear model. And the climate problem, the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, is, is just maybe a very large example uh, I would argue that climate is just a symptom of that same linear system, and that that linear model has led us, inadvertently albeit, I don't think we intended this, to disrupt the natural carbon cycle. In fact, I think this oversimplifies things also, but I think you, the sort of bumper sticker definition, in my mind, of what has caused the climate problem is that we disrupted the Earth's natural carbon cycle, which b before the, the Industrial Revolution, I would suggest was in a kind of a dynamic equilibrium. Yes, it went up and down, but it was in rough equilibrium until we found coal and oil and natural gas, all of these very carbon rich, very beneficial sources of energy, energy rich, but also carbon rich. All of that carbon had been nicely tucked underground geologically for millennia, right? And then in, a, in the geologic blink of an eye, we have redispersed it and put it back in circulation, back up in the atmosphere. And I don't think, I mean, all you need to do is believe in physics to think that putting all those billions of tons of carbon back in circulation would have some effect. So that linear system has led, I would argue, to the climate problem among others. So what do we need instead of that linear system? Well, as some Fortune 500 companies and even some national labs are beginning to say publicly, what we need is a circular economy, a circular system that more closely mirrors the elegant closed loop resource cycles that you find in natural systems, right? Where f waste from one part of the system becomes food for another. We don't, in the fall, I, walking over here, I saw them blowing the leaves into a pile we don't look at those leaves having fallen off the trees and think, what a waste that is. That is so shameful. Look at all those leaves going to waste. Why? No, because they're food for another part of the system. So that, those closed loop resource cycles are really the mental model and the paradigm that the global economy is gonna to need to mirror in the fullness of time. I, I wanna to hasten to add, this doesn't mean no more mining. It doesn't mean no more using virgin materials. But it does mean, increasingly, we depend on resources that are already in circulation. And extracting more value all along the value chain, and including from resources that we have up till now considered to be 
waste products, finding ways to turn those wastes into valuable, into valuable resources. And in the case of fossil fuels, so back in the energy system, since that's the sea I swim in, to the extent we're going to continue to use fossil fuels, we are going to need to evolve a closed loop, a, a circular economy for carbon, if you will, meaning we're going to have to prevent it from going into the atmosphere, but also capture more of it and either store it geologically or capture it and put it to beneficial use. And I'm happy to say that's actually already happening. There is a whole new industry sector, so new it doesn't really even have a settled name yet. Some are calling it carbon tech, some call it carbon recycling, but there's a whole slew of new startup companies figuring out how to take anthropogenic CO2, human-made CO2, and make something productive out of it. Turns out most things on this planet are carbon-based, ourselves included, so uh, there's a lot you can make, it turns out, with carbon dioxide. So I think the good news with this circular economy model is that it's actually the recipe for a whole new wave of innovation and long-term economic prosperity. It's just built on a different design assignment, if I can put it that way. To quote the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which promotes a circular economy around the world, in a circular economy, economic activity builds and rebuilds system health, rather than causing problems that you then have to mitigate later at great expense. Okay, there I need to pause for a swig of water. I feel like Marco Rubio all of a sudden. Okay, so my second proposition, uh, I need to move on though. My second proposition uh, is that using this transdisciplinary approach, which we've now been hearing about, this convergence science approach, which I'm new to but grateful to be a part of the Food, Energy, and Water Systems Project uh, that Elena mentioned earlier, um, I'm, I'm, I would argue that this convergence science approach is actually the, perhaps the only way we can collectively get our heads around the complexity, the synergies, and feedback loops that are inherent in a more circular economy. No single discipline or economic sector is going to be able to possibly wrap their heads around and understand the increasingly complex interrelationships across human and physical systems that's going to be needed. And I would argue the energy world, where I live, uh, is a perfect example of that. It's, a, it's an example, the energy system is a system of systems that itself is becoming more integrated and is converging. What do I mean by that? It's getting harder and harder to distinguish what's the electric sector, what's the transportation sector, and what's the thermal or heating and cooling sector. As we decarbonize the production of electricity and then electrify more parts of the economy, so think electrifying transportation and then possibly electrifying space heating and cooling, water heating, you can already see those lines between what's thermal, what's transportation, what's electricity begin to blur. And never mind looking for other low carbon options for things that won't easily electrify, like making steel or cement or chemicals. So uh, allow me to use just one concept to further illustrate this growing intertwining of systems that's taking place in the energy sector. And it's an idea called power to gas, uh, which is illustrated up here on the slide. Um, first, I want to say, just as a side note, but relevant, uh, I would argue that hydrogen is going to become one of humanity's main zero carbon energy carriers. They actually have a lot in common. Both hydrogen and electricity are only as clean as their means of production. And they're fungible goods. You can make one with the other. You can make, use electricity to make hydrogen by splitting water. And you can use hydrogen to make electricity in a fuel cell. Um, now, in the near term, we could probably make the most hydrogen the way we already make it, by reforming natural gas. If you pair that with carbon capture, you can now make a lot, a lot of hydrogen um, for, for use all across the economy. I, I would offer one other little side note, just because I think it's a personally fascinating. I don't think we planned it this way, but it turns out that human energy use has been steadily decarbonizing since we cut down the first tree. I mean, carbon is basically 100% carbon, then coal, then oil, then natural gas. That progression, each of those fuels has progressively less carbon and more hydrogen in terms of their ratio. And you, I, to me, it's logical that the last stop on that train is that we just leave the carbon behind altogether and we just use the hydrogen as yet another 
zero carbon energy carrier. But I digress. So back to power to gas. So yes, you can make hydrogen from natural gas if you pair that with carbon capture. But if you imagine a world in which we have a very high percentage of renewables uh, on the electricity system, there are going to be times when we are producing more uh, renewable electricity than we need. And during those times of extra capacity, you could use that extra electricity to make hydrogen, as I said, by splitting water. Now you've got hydrogen, so you can, you can put hydrogen into the existing natural gas system up to about 10%. If you go higher than that with the existing pipes, most of them anyway, you cause something called embrittlement. It's such a tiny molecule, it works its way into the metal of the pipes. But we have thousands of miles of hydrogen pipeline, so we know how to do that. You just would have to use different materials. There are composite liners you can put in, and then you could put in hydrogen at a much higher percentage. And then if you have hydrogen left over, you can combine that hydrogen with anthropogenic CO2, so waste sources of CO2, which we happen to have a little extra of, and you can make your own methane, right, CH4. Methane, obviously, is the main constituent in natural gas. You then put that methane into the natural gas pipeline, and voila, power to gas. You have produced your own renewably produced methane. So, but you can see that that took a lot of steps. There's obviously a physics penalty at each of those steps, but one can conceptually imagine how that could work. This kind of uh, interaction is what the Europeans are now calling cross-sector coupling, where, again, the electricity system, the gas system, the heating system, begin to, the lines begin to blur. And I think that kind of cross-sector coupling is going to be essential to optimizing both economically and also physically a low-carbon, high-renewable energy system. And think of it, figuring out how to optimize both the economics and the physical interactions among those individually complex energy systems is going to be hard enough. And then layer on implications for water and maybe by extension food, depending on the system, and you begin to see why nothing short of this kind of transdisciplinary convergent science is going to be required to really understand those interactions and how to optimize those systems. And I would argue that we've only just begun to scratch the surface of what these big infrastructures that we've built, what the synergies are among them. So another couple of examples just to roll around in your head. There's a project in the Twin Cities that's looking at how to use waste heat from sewage and, and put it to productive use heating buildings as part of a heating and cooling system. Or say, for example, using the biomethane that's released at a landfill site where solar is co-located on that same site. So if you, compare, if you combine the solar with this biomethane, you now have essentially a fully dispatchable uh, electricity resource. You don't have to rely on just when the sun is shining. OK, so I'm a convert. Uh, but as essential as convergent science is, I think, to our ability to solve these increasingly complex, sort of four-dimensional chess kinds of challenges, as several other people have noted, there are some real barriers uh, to having multiple parties, both from the academy and outside the academy, like me, participate in this kind of a collaborative research. And I've listed just a few. Again, Lois had a long list. We could probably spend the rest of the day just on those. Um, each discipline, and I don't mean that just inside the university, but outside too, has its own mental models for how the world works. And I think this has only been exacerbated by the fact that we're a world of hyper-specialists, right? We tend to train ourselves to go very deep on some particular thing, and yet somebody still needs to see the forest for all the trees. So mental models are a challenge. Often the disciplines have different assumptions even about how human beings tick, what motivates us, and that can influence the kinds of solutions that such research might produce. Uh, I think as Elena uh, outlined better than I could, uh, the, re the reward structures are quite different in the for-profit sector, the non-profit sector, government, and inside academia. What, how people, quote, get ahead is quite different in those sectors, and that can influence how people behave in this kind of collaborative research environment. And not surprisingly, probably necessarily so, every discipline has its own specialized language. That makes it harder for people to have a shared view of what the problem even is that we're solving together. And it, for some, can be a barrier to even participating. Either they don't feel like they know enough, or they're not smart enough, or they won't understand. So the language can be a barrier itself. And then, of course, we all have 
differences in what we think the role of government is, so that changes what you, what you think policy should or should not do. And one I don't have on the list, but which I think is powerful, we all tend to have different assumptions about the role of technology in society, sort of the techno-optimist versus the Luddite, and also just assumptions about the pace of technological change, I think are often wrong. <laughs> Uh, it often change faster, changes faster than we think it, it will. So all of these taken together, I think, begin to influence the kinds of solutions that can emerge from convergent science, or, or not, as the case may be. Plus, each of our brains are literally wired differently. I mean, I'm not a brain science specialist, but I know that we know enough, we're learning more and more about the way the human brain works. They look so similar from a distance, uh, but it turns out that we all are laying down different neural pathways. There's om almost an infinite number of ways that our brains process and code information and learning. And what it means is, and actually uh, I'm going to take this from a book by David Rock called The Quiet Leader, because he go spends quite a bit of time on this brain science. He says people hear even the simplest things very differently. And the reason for this is that our brains are substantially more different than we acknowledge or than we frankly knew in the past. So in a way, you could say it's a wonder that we ever agree on anything ever. Uh, maybe it's a testament to our cooperation. So, um, so where on earth does this leave us? Uh, well, as if this were not enough, I would argue that we're also battling another kind of human wiring challenge. And that is, and this is true for all of us, our egos, um, lead us to confuse our identity with the views that we hold. So that if I disagree with someone else's view, it doesn't just feel like we're disagreeing, it actually feels like my very identity is being challenged. I think it explains a lot about the fractured uh, political discourse that we find in our country. So as hard as we all try to be rational and fact-based, uh, the honest truth is that we often process information first um, through emotion and through instinct through that reptilian portion in our brain, and then cognition second. Doesn't mean we can't be rational, but the impulse is to be, oh yeah, well, I think. So that's a challenge. What does that mean in practice? Well, my personal view is that I think it means we all need a little humility about what we know for certain, both we as individuals and also our disciplines, like what do we actually know for sure? And back to this idea of convergent science, I think we need to be open to develop solutions that draw on as many disciplines and points of view as possible so that we're at least get closer to being able to cover our blind spots and our own biases. And I think we need to allow people to agree on solutions, even if it's for very different reasons. And we have some specific examples of that happening in our own, in our own work. So I have three humble recommendations, which I think I'm not going to read to you, I'm just going to let them hang there. I want to end by just making sort of a final plug for this idea of convergence science and the 360 view that I think it can give us of problems. And I swear this was not coordinated with Lois. You all are going to think that Lois and I hold stock or something in, in Stephen Johnson's writing career. Um, I swear, we didn't know we were just going to do this. But I also was taken with his book, I recommend it to anyone where good ideas come from, A Natural History of Innovation. I uh, thought it was really a wonderful book, and um, I want to just quote from it here. It, it's similar to a theme Lois noted. Um, the history books like to condense innovation into eureka moments dominated by a single inventor. But most of the key technologies that powered the Industrial Revolution were instances of what scholars call collective invention. Folklore calls Edison the inventor of the light bulb. But in truth, the light bulb came into being through a complex network of interaction between Edison and his rivals, each of them adding a piece to the puzzle along the way. And of course, the same can be true for James Watt and the steam engine and a long list of other, intervention, uh, other innovations. So here is to being smarter together. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to join you today, and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much.
All right, quick note. Um, this is being recorded, so you don't have to take notes, but I encourage you all to go on the Facebook page for the college and watch this over and over, because there's so many details I can't keep up. Secondly, if you are watching online, I encourage you to add comments and questions, because as soon as we're done with the next speaker, we're going to have time for some Q&A. And those in the room, if you're lucky, get a microphone and get to ask a question. Well, all of us to this date have talked about the importance of innovating, the importance of transformation. We've got big ideas as to how someone else should do it. But our third speaker is somebody who actually lives the dream. And so our, I welcome Greg up to tell us about the uh, innovation and learning and transformations going on here in Ohio. Well, thank, uh, again, like uh, my previous speakers, I'd like to thank Ohio State uh, for giving us the opportunity to come down and talk. Um, it, it was interesting. When I first got the email, I was on my, on my plane ride back from Boston, and I'm thinking, wicked solutions. And all I heard over at Boston was wicked this and wicked that. So I had to, <laughs> I had to process this a little bit different. But, you know, when you think about wicked solutions, and I thought, what am I really going to talk about? I started to go back in history, and I'm going to give a little bit of a story before I come back to some of my recommendations on this. But first, I need to introduce a little bit about our company. Uh, who is uh, LEL? Who is Superior? Who is Creative Edge? Uh, Canton, Ohio, Superior Dairy, started in 1922. Um, we're going to be 100 years old in 2022. Uh, fourth generation family business. Um, and we grew our roots in dairy, uh, fluid dairy. We don't have any cows. Uh, and as you can imagine how tough and how wicked of a problem the dairy industry is. Uh, we started to think about doing things very, very differently. And we have sort of got a reputation of being a disruptor. I guess some people call it a provocateur. Um, we just have a very different term for that. So. We're going to, hopefully I did this, okay, it's still on. Um, I want to come back and say, uh, what did we really do here? You, you read the three companies, and what you see is Superior Dairy, and that's what a lot of us know us as, but we really run another company called Creative Edge. And we have a third company, which is a logistics company that moves our products around. And those have very important strategies and when we talk about solving the wicked problem in the fluid dairy, this is how we were able to solve it. And we recently went on a tech transfer over to Israel. And everybody kept using the words incubator and accelerator and, and all these fancy words. And I kept thinking to myself, well, all we do is create, deliver, and make it. That's all we do. We don't, we don't view ourselves as an incubator. We don't view ourselves as an accelerator. What we say is, we're going to go take these ideas and we're going to create. So back in uh, early 2000, um, we just lost a huge customer to bankruptcy called Kmart. Um, we lost Fleming Foods. So our business was being just completely decimated. So we had to go out and sit down and think, how are we going to be different? How are we going to survive? We were a small regional company. I think the farthest we delivered product was Michigan. Um, and we sat down, and we started to call what we said we're going to create, and we're going to create with a purpose. We had all kinds of ideas. Um, we didn't know how to commercialize them, and we made a lot of mistakes. So what we did is we came back through this problem-solving thing, and then this is the result of what we found, okay? And I want to talk a little bit about this because at the essence of these wicked problems, right, when we went out and you see the first arrow is the one where we went out and started talking to our customers, and we asked our customers what they wanted, and it was the truth. They wanted faster horses. I want you to run your milk faster. I want better production. I want you to teleport your milk to me. Right? I don't want to pay for distribution costs. This is what we were hearing. Well, they didn't even know what they wanted. They didn't know what they could have. And I think as an industry, I think as science, I think one of our biggest problems is we go out and ask everybody what they want. And we try to give it to them. 
solve the problem of plastic bottles. What do we want? Well, we don't, we want to throw them away, right? We want to litter, right? That's what you hear. So we're going to solve the litter problem, right? This is part of what I talk about and when we start to talk about these wicked solutions, it's a great example. If we ask our customers what they want, that's what they're going to tell us. So we need to show them what they could have. Now in lies science, now in lies commercializing science. And one of the things that I love about us being a disruptor is we don't worry about the next step. We worry about getting the science out there so we can learn from it. And there's some more to this. So when we get down through this, and we interview our customers, we start with an idea generation. And there's a lot of young, youthful people in the room. Back in 2000, when we were struggling, the best thing our company did is the third generation handed it off to the fourth generation, which were a bunch of young people who didn't know any better, who didn't have experience, and let us create something very different. We didn't know any better. We didn't have anyone to tell us. And, and I'll never forget this. Um, we went to the first strategic milk thinking initiative. And we were offering some of our ideas. And they told us, I mean, I literally got laughed off the stage and they told us, yeah, you guys, you don't, you've missed it. You don't understand our business. I can remember that very, very vividly. So, that is why I sit down and say one of the things we have to do in creating these wicked problems is we have to think very differently and we have to engage our youth. And that's what we were able to do. And just because it's an idea doesn't mean it's good or bad. There's a way to vet that out. And, and like we talk about, we love the idea of the idea generation. Because what that takes us to is the capability development. And when I talk about bringing ideas quick and fast to the market, we started down this road. So one of our ideas that we created was the idea of getting rid of milk cases. What did that mean? Right? We got the idea of how do we take product and give our customers and shorten the lead time for our customers? How do we make them what they want, make what they want? So again, when we first started that, I, our family could have come back and said, that's crazy, you have to put it in a milk case. Why are your packaging costs higher right? We, you're not getting the end result. They, they trusted to let the business model evolve and create and move quickly. Half the science, half the issues that we came out of came right out of this idea generation. The other half came out of the capability development. And what we did there was quickly build clunky, mean, tough prototypes that we could take out to the market and learn very, very quickly. So when you talk about the idea of innovation and creating, I think some of those words are misused. It really comes down to how fast can you get it out there? How fast can you learn from it? We weren't worried about filing a patent. We didn't know any better. What we were trying to do was solve problems really, really quickly. So again, I talk about wicked problems, wicked solutions. What we found when we got out there quickly with these capabilities is the industry attacked it. It was new, it was different, and it wasn't mainstream. So they attacked it. They didn't understand it, so they attacked it. So part of the key issues with being tough, edgy, and mean is part of the solving problem is, and I think we said it earlier, is you need a courageous leadership. You need to be tough, edgy, and mean. And that is not something that you say, oh, hey, that's that's... That's okay, I get it. No, it's exactly what it is. Our company has a really interesting culture. And that culture is to go out and to fight passionately with these ideas. And if we don't have someone to fight with, the joke is we always go in the back room and fight with ourselves. Just because we're tough, edgy, and mean. And I think when we start to solve these wicked problems, that's part of the cultural shift that we have to have. Because you will, you're going to come up, I guarantee there's great ideas that will come out of this thing, and you'll find different forces to stomp them out. It's funny, we were just talking to, we were talking to a, a packaging line, and we said, okay, what should we do with plastic or paper? What's better? Found out both of them are, are, are recyclable. Find out both of them have their problems. 
But when you find the lobbying around the different groups, all of a sudden you don't know which is better, right? So again, what we did in this capability development is we shut ourselves off to the industry. We didn't let the vendors tell us how to build equipment. We didn't let the industry tell us what was recyclable and what wasn't. We were able to determine that on our own. So I think that's part of when we start to look at these wicked solutions that we'll talk about. These are part of the attributes we need to think about. Is the forces in the industry want to sell equipment? They want to sell a different product line, but we don't know what we have. So when we shut ourselves down to do our capability development, we shut ourselves off to the industry. Not because we want to, because it lets the ideas really generate for the right reasons. Again, the next thing is the prototyping, getting out there quickly. And what we do is we don't wait for it to be 100%. We don't wait for it to be the right business model just yet. We put it out there because what we find when we do that is we do two things. We learn a whole lot quicker and we're able to create faster because all of a sudden something cropped up that we didn't see and that you, would have, you could have let it be 100% and you would have never seen. That's when you've truly been innovative. That's why I always talk about this when we prototype. We use the word innovation very, very, I mean, we use it like, hi, hello. And I think when we talk about true innovation, you'll start to see that there's no way to predict some of these things. There's no way to understand them. So when we move product fast and we move ideas fast through the market, it's with the idea of failing. You could tour our company today and you'll see 10 technologies running in the background and you won't even know. And we don't even know if they're successful yet or not. So again, these are the ideas is to move quickly through them. And it'll come back with this creating of the purpose. The business model comes out, okay? And what we do is we take that business model now and then the real designing comes in. Now the real problem solving comes in. And again, it's fast. It's with the idea of moving quickly through the markets. So what did we do when we did this? We got rid of milk cases. We got rid of, we, we started talking about flexible filling. What we found is we were really sustainable. We, were, we became green. We cut our chemical costs by 50%. We cut our water consumption by 80%. We don't wash tanks anymore. We eliminated all of these things. Our distribution network, we spent $16 million on our own trucks. We were able to consolidate the distribution network and use outside carriers. So we had a huge carbon footprint gain, right? Very successful with this. And I love telling the story because this is a wicked problem. We won the Sustainability of the Year Award at a large retailer and we were doing business with them. And when we went to go accept that award, the competitor came in and undercut us because he lost the business. And we weren't even doing business with them when we got the award. So when we think about wicked solutions and we think about sustainability, we think about the market in the industry, we need to think about all those external factors. Because again, people are trying to kill change. And I believe that in, in, when we get to industry, when we talk about all these different categories, it becomes really nice and really easy. But when you start to mess with people's businesses, it starts to get tough, edgy, and mean. And that's what we like about this. That's why we like to be out, out going out quickly with the, uh, the science. We get into the production prototyping. If you come to the dairy, you'd see a, a, a fluid milk facility running 200 gallons of milk a week. It's a prototype facility. We're designing and creating in that facility all the time. We're changing things all the time. It's evolving all the time. And I think that's part of that solutions that we need to create as we attack wicked problems. And that's when we talk about the business model and being fluid, it's always changing. What was our result? So out of our, our, our dairy out of Canton, Ohio, we delivered to 44 states. Um, we let this evolve. We didn't know where this was going to go when we started. 
So the business model started to evolve when we started to put it out there in the right lights and we started talking to the right customers. It, was a, it wasn't a sustainability conversation. Sustainability was built into the conversation. And you could start to see how the model changed. So again, 2 million gallons a week out of our, our, out of our, our dairy in Canton, Ohio. We bring milk. We work with our dairies as a sustainable part of that. But it's a very different business model. And that's where I like, when I started looking at this Wicked Solutions, I think we need to start to push a very different business model. So what I wanted to talk about is we started to look at focusing on logic and not results. I hear a lot of result conversations with people. What we need to do is really focus on the logic of why. And that's one of the things we learned, OK? We also talk about fail with a purpose. Everybody in the R&D space or the tech space, they use these fancy terms like fail fast, fail quick, fail. To me, you're not being edgy enough if you don't fail with a purpose. We haven't gone out far enough with our ideas. And I think as an industry, we play it safe. We are afraid to go out and say it didn't work. We love that. In fact, you'll hear our young engineers uh, the first thing I'll ask them when we get done doing our uh, uh, test projects, I said, did you blow it up? And they'll say, well, I said, then go blow it up. Fail. I want to see what happens when we blow it up. Because we haven't gone out far enough. As an industry, we need to push those boundaries in a big way. Okay? And if, you, if it worked the first time, we didn't push it fast enough. We didn't push it hard enough. I really believe that. And then again, designing evolving systems. Do not design, we don't want to design manufacturing systems that are hard to evolve. We always talk about building systems so our consumers will want them. Building our systems so that we can add sustainability to the back end, add as we start to change. Do not build a system that is rigid and hard. That goes against every business logic that people will tell you. But in our business and in our world, the consumer is so confused, we are so confused as a market, we are, that if we were trying to be rigid and trying to be predictable, we will miss it. So instead, we adopted the philosophy of evolving systems. I think Lois used the word plastic, I loved it. Something that's got some flexibility to it, something that isn't so um, business, um, it, it doesn't prohibit you from growing, okay? Again, facilitating the young minds. That is so important when we talk about these systems. And that's what we've done in our business, is we've let the young people come in and really start to help us change. I think it's tough for us in businesses. I watch it at, I watch it at the industry side of things. You'll go into these senior level meetings, and they don't let the young people talk. It's, I'm the senior guy. I do all the talking. So some of the things we try to do is engage, right? And it's, it's tough to let that happen. And we as an industry need to let the young really start to facilitate this thing. And then of course, I like the idea of letting evolution take its course. Don't think you have to know all the answers. You just have to prepare to evolve. And that's one of the things that sounds really different in our business, but that's exactly what we try to do. So, what do I want to talk about real quick on the, the application of Wicked Systems? First of all, we as an industry, whether it's scientists, whether it's commercializing science, whether it's people in, the, in selling and buying, we got to come to the idea we're not going to do it alone anymore. Okay? If you're an agent of change, we're not going to do it alone. That's, our, that's part of our problem with the Wicked S Systems is we're fragmented, and we have very different alignment tools. Our customers have different sets of metrics versus what we have. Our industry partners have different set of metrics, right? Regulatory gets in the way, right? Different set of metrics. Lack of science. Isn't, I'm, I guess I'm talking to a science community, but isn't it interesting to watch the new products that hit the market that don't have any sustainability to them, right? And we don't understand the science of them. And they become marketing gimmicks. 
That is a problem. That's a bigger problem than we know when we try to solve these wicked problems because we need the truth and we need to get the truth out in people's hands. We fight that issue all the time, especially in the dairy space, right? I mean, cows are the reason why we have carbon problems, the carbon footprint's in jeopardy. They don't understand the science behind it. So again, when we start talking about applying these wicked solutions, we have to come to agreement that we're not going to do it alone. We, we did a nice thing by ourselves. It would have been so much easier to have the right group behind it. Okay? And when I talk about the, the metrics of it, our metrics in the business have to change, right? I think the metrics downstream have to change. I think as we, I've heard people talk in the industry um, on how they're evaluated and what they do, what the science side has to change. I learned to be an engineer. I love to tell this story. I was, I got my engineering degree. I went out in industry and thought, boy, I knew what I was doing. The day I built, designed, built, and ran my first piece of equipment and found out the problems that you had with it is when I learned, when I finally became an engineer. And I use that same analogy in wicked systems. Is if we as a group design it, build it, and run it, it will be successful. If I only have to design it and I walk away, it will fail. And I, I say that on those three processes. So part of our wicked systems has to be that full continuity and making sure we're all engaged in it. And I come back to, that's when you'll learn to be tough, edgy, and mean. So um, one of the things that we did very smart, and you, you talk about create, uh, when we created it, when we could make it, and we could deliver it. We need to drive, we need to have the industry that drives the science into the market. It is very important. You will never get people to do it if you don't do it, you have a, a way of driving it into the market yourself. We would have never been able to grow, we would never have been able to change if we didn't do it ourselves. If we didn't have to look at the whole system and say, yep, we got this great idea, we got this other great idea, and then wait for someone else to deliver it. We had to create our own delivery company in order to make sure that we could do it under the right set of metrics. That wasn't our forte, that wasn't our expertise, but that's part of the wicked system that we had to solve. And I think what you'll find as you start to look at each one of these, the system is much bigger, right, than what we think it is in our own expertise. All of a sudden, you do start to find yourself involved in a different set of economics that you didn't think you'd have to be involved because it becomes a barrier, and you have to eliminate those barriers. So when we start to design these systems and we design the, the organization to do it, we need to keep these in mind because we would have never been successful if we didn't have that, I call it the hammer and nail syndrome. We had to be, the superior dairy had to be the hammer to drive the innovation and the science into the market for Creative Edge. It had to be. So again, let's talk about creating alignment for a minute. And let's talk about how we apply some logic to, if you asked us to apply logic to this idea of wicked systems. The thing I love to talk about is I'd like to change my, my, my workflow a little bit different and talk about entrepreneurial vision. And that's that twitchy, is this guy really, is he really sane or is he, is he know what he's talking about, right? It's out there. It's, it's truly science, right? It's something that as a scientist, you're going to go approach this thing very differently. You're going to get up tomorrow, and you're not going to do the same thing you did yesterday or the day before. You're going to think, how are we going to approach this? Now we're going to get somewhere, right? That's that entrepreneurial vision. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have purposed failure, right? I love purpose failure because we don't know what's going to happen. That's how different we're going to think. And then we're going to go ahead and research that purposed failure. Therein lies the explosion. Once we failed, now we go research. Therein lies the, per, the, the explosion. That's how we're going to attack these wicked systems. And again, I, I, don't, I say this because we made the mistakes of playing it safe. 
we've made the mistakes of going out there and getting too edgy. There's a balance. And this is exactly how we see the balance working. Because what you find is, how do we go commercialize science quicker? These two steps tell us how to commercialize science quicker. It also leads the path for the future. And that's what's important. And then prototyping and implementation. We, I, I was going through this with a couple other um, universities, and, and they approached me and said, hey, look, I want you to look at this. I've got a patent on it already. Oh, well, how, how many patents do you have? Well, I've got a bunch, but none of them are out there. Okay, and I remember, I remember one, one thing that someone told me is, patents are just expensive pictures if you don't use them. We have, I think, 42 patents now, and probably 36 of them, maybe 37, are commercialized. We never filed for a patent until they were out in the market being sold. One of the indicators when we talk about science and we talk about going out and solving problems was when we would present these ideas to our customers. We didn't do it under confidentiality agreements. We, did, we just presented them. And it was funny, the customer said, yeah, we took it to your competitor, and they thought you were crazy. They thought there was no way to do it. So again, it's a different business model. It's a different way of thinking. But what it does is it drives change, big, big change in the industry. The business research comes after we get to the prototype, because then we really know what we have. We don't do focus groups. We've been burned by focus groups. Again, we don't, we don't ask what people want. And I think this is what this process allows us to do, is we can go create a future where we can see it when we can commercialize the science. And again, involving, evolving the implementation, and that's, our, that's, that's a, pr a production line that's designed to change. And that's part of, from a commercial sense, is don't spend $7 million on a piece of equipment that you can't change. Don't build a reactor that you can't change with, or else you're going to just spend $7 million, and it's going to be risky. And what's going to happen? You're not going to do it. It'll be a barrier to entry. And I, I mean that. Okay? And I love the idea of bringing the science together with the industry. I like the difference between entrepreneurs and implementers. Okay? Because the entrepreneurs and the implementers don't get along. Right? They're just diam diametrically opposed. And that's where you start to see the, that they all add value to the system. I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts and just get you thinking out loud. One of the things we said when we looked at this is, what if we took this gray area as our existing facility? And what if we said, OK, why don't we create new entities with different metrics? Why can't I have a building that's designed for commercializing science? What does that mean? Does that mean? You have teachers teaching, kids learning, kids building something to take to market. Why can't, why can't their class be designing and building something that gets into the market? How many times have we, have we brought kids in that are smart kids and they already know how to do it? Right? They've, they've learned from the business schools on how to take something to market. It's not changing. Engineers that learn how to design, but it doesn't run, right? I think we've got to take these, the kids and take, put them in an environment that they can learn and grow and change. And we start the idea of the culture that they can do anything quicker. And we give them that space to go do it. I really do mean that when I talk about it. I have an incubator space up there because, again, you want to take them through the incubator stage. You want them to go create and design and think. Okay? And then, obviously, they take out and go run it and learn it. What if? Show them how to create an evolving business model. That is, if there's any business people in here, they'll tell me I'm crazy. They'll tell me it doesn't pencil and it doesn't work. And, and I can tell you it does. That's why I say when I talk about evolving business models, good example, being very unorthodox, we don't spend a dime on marketing. Did you guys know that? Who's, who's, how many people have looked at Superior Dairy's website? 
go ahead and do it. You'll get a kick out of it. It's, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> it is. And we don't have a brand. We brand our technology. We don't have a label. We co-pack for everybody. Again, it's a very different model. But when we look at the value stream and going out to the, it didn't have a place. So we spend very little marketing money. It all goes into technology and science. Very different business approach. Okay? And I, I tell everybody, I'm not saying if it's right or wrong. It's just different. Oh. Ooh, did I do that? Cindy, did you kick that? So the other thing I want to talk about is, is the creating the future through disruptive purpose. This isn't necessarily what people like to do. Um, I think in the, in the academic world or in the, in the business world, everybody's worried about being the first or being different. I don't think we're going to solve any wicked problems if we're not disruptive. I really mean that. I think we have to get out there very quickly. I'm not talking about making almond milk. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about a nuclear reactor. I believe there are smart ways to get out there very quickly and be very disruptive. And that's where I mean it's, it's part of that business model that we need to talk more of. Because if you feel, if you wake up every day, and, and in our industry, Terrible milk prices, the cows are in trouble, the farmers are in trouble, the single biggest dairy just went bankrupt. It's going to be nuts. It's going to be disruptive anyway. And the only way we're going to solve that is we're going to go out and start to attack every one of these all over again in a disruptive model. So let me leave you with this. And I want you guys to think about this for a minute. Because it's not just about the dairy industry. It's not just about energy. It's not just about how we approach. But what we need to do is bring commercial technology, commercial agriculture, and youth, put them together. And on one side, you have this commercial entity where you've got sales and you're driving it, but we're reinvesting back into this model. And on the other side, you've got science taking and selling these ideas quickly so that we can reinvest. And we need to talk about this business model to create a solution to wicked problems. That way, we don't have to wait for somebody to fund us. We don't have to wait for somebody to design something, right? We do it ourselves together because we're not going to do it alone. And I really mean that. As a company, we're, not, we're ready to embrace this model. I think there's other companies, once we build it, they will come. They don't understand it, right, because they're entrenched in it. But once we build this model, they will come because I think it starts to become holistic. And again, when I use the example of design it, build it, and run it, that's all this is, is designing it, building it, and running it, and they will come. So again, I, I, th I want to thank everybody for letting me show up today to talk about this. Uh, it's a very different approach I know it would be, and I really do believe that part of the solution with the evolving, or with the wicked systems is to change our business and change what we do immediately and not be afraid to go out and be disruptive, okay? Thank you. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you to our panelists and to our speakers. Um, the time has been quite liquid <laughs> with the density of ideas. Um, I, we, do, we are going to take the last 10 minutes uh, and invite our panelists up. Um, and while they're coming up, uh, I would invite anyone in the audience who has a question that you would like to pose to raise your hand. And we have a mic that is traveling to you. 
right here's a question right here. Well, thank you so much. Uh, a lot to digest and a lot to uh, try to dissect. So, Josh. So while you guys get uh, mic'd up, thanks very much for being here, for traveling the distance to talk with us today. I'm Josh Knights. I'm with the Sustainability Institute here at Ohio State. And the question that I have for you is, given the complexity of wicked problems, given how big they are and how hard it is to get our arms around them, is there a danger that the solutions we try to develop end up just being lowest common denominator solutions because they are such big problems and therefore uh, fairly generic or fairly weak in terms of a solution? I'm going to respond to that really quickly. We often think of the word solutions as being the end result. And, and I think we need to think about it being a moving solution, an evolving solution. This might be the solution that works right where we're at right this moment. Um, but you, we can't put it on the shelf and say, okay, I fixed that problem. I'm going to go on to the next. Um, and I, so I think it's how we think about solutions as not being end products. So interestingly, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I guess I would say that our experience working in the energy space is actually in a way, and this is counterintuitive, is just the opposite. So one of the, it's not the only way that the Great Plains Institute works, but one of the distinguishing features of our work is to pick a difficult, challenging, wicked problem in the energy sector, identify all the interests who need to be a part of solving that, metaphorically lock them in a room and see if we can't broker a consensus on a path forward. And you would think that in that kind of setting that it might be sort of a race to the bottom or lowest common denominator, like all you get out the other end is pablum. But our lived experience is actually just the opposite. And I don't know if that's because the different interests around the table, part of it is that they, they, um, they know that they need to give something in order to get more of what they want. And I think there's also something that happens with and this, I hope, will be true for other kinds of collaborations. When those folks get to know one another on sort of a more human level and they begin to build some trust with one another so that it's not just, you know, sue the grizzled industrialist and Matt, the lefty environmentalist, like they actually come to, to know each other some. They, they, something, there's an alchemy that takes place there where they travel a learning curve together to the point where, and develop enough trust with one another that they begin to be prepared to agree on a common set of facts. And if we run a process where we don't, and I sort of hinted at this in my remarks, where we don't insist that people agree to something for exactly the same reasons, like people can come to a solution for their own reasons, um, we actually find more often than not that what comes out the other end is a set of solutions that maybe no one of those interests around the table would have come to on their own but which in the end they can all get behind. Again, albeit for quite different reasons often. Yeah, and I think from, I'm, I'm gonna look at the question from a different angle because part of what causes the lowest common denominator is how we position that in the whole system. So as we start to talk about the different, the different opportunities with it, if, if we position it to be the lowest common denominator, it will be the lowest common denominator. What we need to do is position it with the idea of the evol evolution of the new sciences. Because if they think this is the best or this is where we're at, then everybody starts to come after it in a very different view. If we can show and demonstrate the science and where we're taking the science, all of a sudden it becomes a step-by-step step -step approach that allows it to grow and evolve in, 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 a, in, a, in the right fashion we want it to. Thank you. Any other questions from the room? Oh, here we go. Hi, I'm Tori. I'm, I work for the Ohio Environmental Council. I'm a um, CFAS alumni. Um, and I just have kind of a big question. Something that you said, Lois, it was a quote, um, some environments squelch new ideas and some environments seem to breathe them effortlessly. So I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on how to create these types of workspaces that breed innovation while still getting your job done. Because 
failure costs money, brainstorming takes time, which costs money. So I guess how do you strike that balance of still operating in a way that it makes sense and how the organization is created to operate, but then still being innovative? I'm going to let you two guys, because you've operationalized it. So it's a great question. My first answer is to read Stephen Johnson's book, because he probably has a more cogent answer than I'm going to give you. But um, I mean, his basic thesis, which I think Lois laid out nicely, is that for, for somebody to be sparked with a really innovative idea, so, somebody said it wasn't Stephen Johnson, you know, before you have a good idea, you have to have lots of ideas. Uh, and I think this idea of liquid networks doesn't, I mean, we're still struggling with trying to create that kind of culture inside Great Plains Institute. But I, one of the ways that we try to make that happen is that pretty much every single project we do is a partnership with other organizations. So again, it's this having kind of an ecosystem of people involved that bring different um, both worldviews and lived experience and different financial interests at stake. I mean, having a lot of different interests involved in a project, it makes it messier and it makes it take longer, but it also helps uh, sort of fill in one another's blind spots. And I think it, it helps create this kind of liquid network uh, environment in which ideas can clash and bump up against one another. And we almost never come out the other end of one of our, these collaborative stakeholder engagement processes. We ne almost never come out the other end with the idea we thought might come out the other end, uh, which I think is a testament to the power of those networks. Well, and, and speaking from experience, because, you know, in the dairy industry, you know, we didn't have this big budget to innovate with. It doesn't take a lot of money it takes more time and having the right people just to go, just to go play. Um, so we didn't, we didn't have, we, we didn't have the luxury of going out to the organ, different organizations and, and do some different things collaboratively. We sort of just set up a little shop and started to play. And it started to grow organically with the successes that we saw out of it. So I, I do believe, I think a lot of people think that there's a mindset that innovation and R&D costs a lot of money. Some of the simplest ideas and some of the best ideas come out of very rudimentary designs when you're over here because you don't have a lot of money to spend. And all of, it makes you become creative and innovative in a very different way. So I, I would almost encourage it because it sparks a different level of innovation. The one thing about the structure that's, that, that at least I found with our research projects was that I actually had to have committed people that were really committed to working through the problem. Um, because it, um, if you had people that were not engaged, then indeed it would it was it was very very difficult and that was I I used to tease my department chair that it was wonderful in this project people self-selected to be on this project as opposed to an academic department that that you don't always self-select who your colleagues are and it gets a little more difficult for you to to work with each other but but the thing is it, it it's it's back to what Greg was saying you have to allow disagreement and dissent and what what you're doing in the structure is creating a safe environment in order to um, challenge each other so that it doesn't become acrimonious so that it doesn't become personal so there's a whole set of one of the very first things that we did was actually set ground rules with how we were going to have these kind of vigorous conversations and and still at the end of the day uh, be able to move forward great Thank you. I apologize that we are out of time in terms of uh, allowing for other questions. Um, uh, before I turn it over to Doug Jackson-Smith to provide some uh, brief final comments, I want to thank our panelists for the tremendous uh, insights and ideas and observations they've shared with us and give them very, very fast last opportunity to respond uh, to the many variety of things that we have heard here today. I mean, when Greg is using words like move fast, blow it up, these are not terms that you think of when you think of the university. The university does not move fast. Um, we're very reluctant to blow things up. So with that in mind, um, from each of you, if, we, if there was one single most important thing that you would advise public universities to do, 
what would that be? Um, first of all, I think, and I'll speak specifically about Ohio State, but most public universities, um, I think you have all the answers internally. If you blew one thing up quickly, and is, is the metric system in which faculty have to work under. Let them be reverse mentors. Let them be creative. Let them get out to industry. Because most of the time, it's not about the science. It's about all of the red tape and all the metrics that get in the way of science. And that is the one thing that hasn't changed. So the business model has to change on all levels. And that doesn't mean that industry doesn't have to change the way it approaches science either. I agree with all of that. But I think that's the one thing um, the university could, could do quickly, and that would make a lot of sense. I just want to say that convergent science using transdisciplinary structures is not a substitute for not doing deep science, for not continuing to do the kind of science that we've been doing. Those are the building blocks. And so you, we, can't, we can't do the kind of big science that we need to do without the underpinnings of, of, of the science that um, actually allows us then to put lots of those ideas on the table. And so it's not an either or. And I have to stress that, that we're, we're not asking for the, the kind of basic science that we're doing to go away. We need that basic science, but we need those basic scientists to be open and to be ready to talk with other scientists so we can learn from them and begin to do this integration that's so necessary. So I agree with that. I, I don't think it's a, a one or the other. I think it's a both and. I guess from my standpoint, um, and maybe, Greg, this echoes what, what I think you were saying, and this would not be an easy thing, but I actually think the most powerful thing that a university could do is, is not to blow up the current reward system. I don't think that's realistic and maybe not even necessary, but I think it could be expanded so that the kinds of things that get you ahead professionally, uh, that there's a longer list of what those things are and that that list would include the kind of collaborative projects that we've been talking about today. Because I think the systems that humanity faces going forward, almost all of them are so complicated that they need the smarts of all the disciplines we can muster. And so it seems to me it would be nice if the reward system inside academia rewarded those of you in academia for pursuing those really difficult challenges and doing it in a way that rewards you professionally. Thank you. Please join me for thanking the panelists. And <laughs> wonderful. And to Doug. <laughs> I only have a 20 minute presentation, don't worry. <laughs> Two thoughts. One, I've never been accused of being edgy, tough, and mean, and maybe I should change the way I operate a little bit more in my <laughs> operations. I, yeah, you could probably fix that. Um, second, I think the one of the cardinal um, things I really believe in is the idea of a land grant university. Um, I go back that 150 years of Ohio State and a few years before, and perhaps I'm nostalgic about what was going on at the time, and it wasn't really that insightful and carefully thought out. But a genius idea was to say we need to invest in public institutions, that, that, that without public institutions that can facilitate sort of the development of knowledge and the application of knowledge and engagement between scientists and knowledge innovators and society and players, um, that idea is as true and as relevant today as it is was then, and I think the, the 21st century version of what we're talking about in terms of convergent science and transdisciplinary science requires a backbone. Um, it requires an investment in institutions. And what I would ask for as we go forward is, is you know, support for the kinds of creative innovations that universities like Ohio State are walking into. It's not work that we always get rewarded for, that's been said. Um, it is work that costs real money and takes real time. That's one lesson I've had in 20 plus years of doing this kind of work is we never have enough money to support the support infrastructure, the people, the glue that makes our relationship building among each other and between ourselves and our partners work. Um, and without societal interest and support for that mission or that vision that land grant universities should do that kind of work, it's not gonna ever happen. Um, and so I think growing conversation 
um, in society, with our partners, with the universities, is necessary to kind of get that kind of recognition that that space needs to be created. Today, I'm sure, will change the game. At the end of this two-hour period, I'll walk out that door and everything will be different. And I appreciate you being along for that momentous opportunity. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation. Thanks to our speakers for coming. Thanks to the college and the, and the Sustainability Institute for supporting this. Thanks to the National Academies, I think, for um, being there as an institution that really represents, I think, the pinnacle of what is possible um, in, in providing an objective, neutral, kind of uh, science-based but society-engaged conversation. Um, and we're proud to be a part of that here at this university and, and let the conversation continue. Speaking of which, my last and only slide, please join us in the lobby for the reception. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>